This is infamous ex-boyfriend killer Jody Arias, and she has just been arrested for first-degree homicide and is now being interrogated by Detective Flores of the Mesa, Arizona Police Department. Now, even if you're already familiar with this case, I would like to direct your attention to something that occurs in the first hour following her initial arrest. Because while Jody is proclaiming her innocence, she is about to inadvertently implicate herself in the homicide of Travis Alexander. Listen closely. And the camera actually took a couple of photos by accident during the time he was being killed. Really? Yeah, Jody, really. You were there. Quit playing this game. It's time for you to just come out and, I and didn't tell know. me. I didn't know. I didn't know. I'm, I did not hurt Travis. Did you catch the moment where she stops herself after saying, I didn't know? Because of course she didn't know. No one other than the person involved in the crime would have known that the camera had taken those pictures. But she quickly stops herself and reiterates something we all know now is a lie. But listen to what Arias says immediately afterwards. We have the picture. Jody's request to see the pictures of one of the most brutal and gruesome homicides I have ever come across in my career is both deeply disturbing and incredibly revealing. Of course, we now know that Jody was responsible for the homicide, and in this moment, a more likely explanation for why she would ask to see the pictures of her mutilated ex boyfriend is that she wanted to verify that the police had in fact recovered the camera that she had attempted to destroy. And she wanted this information to ascertain what police knew so that she could pivot and begin to craft an entirely new set of lies. And this is just one of many moments in the Jody Arias case that we will analyze in today's video. Now, to some, it may be obvious that Jody Arias is a pathological liar, and to that end, there is little to learn from someone that has such a loose relationship with the truth. However, it is my sincere belief that there are deeply important lessons we can learn from studying the mind of this unrepentant killer. In a society that is increasingly plagued by the horrors of relationship-related violence, there is deep intrinsic value in being able to detect the early signs of a partner displaying pathological tendencies or an untreated underlying mental health disorder that threatens the safety of you or your loved ones. Today, I would like to invite you to join me as we delve into the mind of a narcissistic ex-girlfriend driven by rage and jealousy who would do anything to have the man of her dreams. A woman who absolutely refused to take no for an answer. This is Through the Eyes of a Pathological Liar, the Jody Arias case. Understanding Jody's History Pathological liars are some of the most reviled and hated members of society, and yet they are often some of the least understood. Understanding and awareness is a critical component of preparedness when faced with someone exhibiting these psychological behaviors. We now know that Jody was formally diagnosed as having BPD or borderline personality disorder. But for the purposes of this video, we will focus on the elements of her psychological profile that drove her to impulsively and chronically lie and its relation to the crime for which she was convicted. Pathological lying is stated to be a chronic behavior wherein a person habitually or compulsively lies, the characteristics of which have been described to include an internal motive that isn't easily clinically discernible. Additional pathological traits include when the subject tells stories that seeks to frequently paint themselves in a favorable light and characterizes themselves as either the hero or the victim. And when you view the next clip, it would appear that this has been a known personality trait that Aries' own parents had been aware of since her adolescence. 
This is the father of Jody Arias, and he is conducting his initial interview with law enforcement just after her arrest. And this is what he chooses to tell law enforcement about his eldest child. She doesn't trust us because we're parents. And when she was in eighth grade, she got busted for growing marijuana with our Tupperware, putting it on top of the roof. We found it, they called the sheriff department. And then they busted her, and then, I don't know, some of her friends or something. And then we searched her room. That was the first time we've ever searched her room. And after that, she was so, she was kind of like, uh, something turned in her head that we were nosy parents and we were gonna, we were gonna search everything she had. So she hid everything from us and always has since then. Wow. Never, she's never been honest with us since then. And she was uh, probably 14 then. And she has never been honest with us ever since then. Imagine for a moment, you've just been arrested for first degree homicide. And this is what your own father chooses to say about you to law enforcement? But surprisingly, the most compelling part of this interview is an easy to miss moment that is truly shocking when connected to the facts we now know. In this next segment, Detective Flores is casually discussing how Travis had helped Jody extensively throughout the entirety of their tumultuous relationship. And this is the story that Jody's father recounts to the detective. As far as I know, but I do know that uh, one day when she, she called me crying hysterically when she decided to moved to Mesa, Arizona, she snuck up at his house and she looked in the window and she saw him there on the couch with another woman. And here they, she was planning about marrying this guy. This moment is shocking because her father is clearly unaware that the story he just told law enforcement is actually a lie. It seems quite evident that he is simply parroting the story that Jody told him in the moment that she called in hysterics. And he doesn't seem to know that she moved to Mesa, Arizona after her and Travis had already broken up. She wasn't catching a partner committing an affair. She was stalking an ex-boyfriend in the privacy of his own home who was simply trying to move on. Jody Arias had been weaving her web of lies for so long that her own family no longer had the ability to determine the truth from lies. But in order for us to better understand Jody's motivation to frequently obscure the truth in this case, we have to start back at the beginning. Because I would like to present to you what I believe is Jody's true motivation for her crime. And I believe the evidence to support my assertion is not only compelling, but when viewed in the light of all the supporting facts, it appears to be a truth hidden in plain sight successfully obscured by a masterful liar. The beginning of the end. The investigation of Travis Alexander's homicide began in haste on June 9th, 2008, after his roommates found the aftermath of his gruesome murder. Travis's friends and loved ones would immediately express suspicion to law enforcement of a singular culprit that had been the concern of everyone in the weeks and months preceding his untimely death. The day after Travis was found, Jody would initiate contact with law enforcement by leaving a message for Detective Steve Flores. And on June 10, 2008, he would return her call. The following segment is the recording of that call played during Jody's lengthy trial. And from the onset, we can see a carefully crafted narrative that was intended as a means to assuage the already considerable suspicion of her culpability. What I'm about to show you is truly remarkable. Hello. Hello, uh, can you speak to Jody, please? This is Jody. Hey, Jody, this is Detective Steve Flores of the Mesa Arizona Police Department. Oh, hey, how are you? Good, I, I just got a message uh, from one of my patrol officers that uh, you needed to talk to me about something. Well, I just wanted to offer any assistance that I might have. I was a really good friend of Travis's, and I just, you know, I know that I don't know a lot of anything, but... What, what have you heard so far? I heard that he was, that he passed away, and that um, it was, I, I don't know. I've heard all kinds of rumors. I heard there was a lot of blood. I heard that um, his roommate found him, or his friend found him, or people were, I, I'm sorry. So I, I'm upset them. I've heard that I... Jody just went from sounding like she was crying to nearly instantaneously going back to telling her story. This is a very common tactic of pathological liars. 
It's when they utilize empathy as a weapon. And in my years of working with inmates for the Department of Corrections, I've coined the term as empathy farming. And Jody Arias could teach a masterclass in it. She is trying to establish herself as a caring, honest, and concerned ex-girlfriend who shouldn't even be considered as a possible suspect. She will continue to utilize this learned behavior throughout the entirety of this case. Post in the comments below any inconsistencies you find throughout the video where Jody's story just doesn't match up. Let's continue. Nobody's been able to get a hold of him for almost a week, which and that was about the last time I spoke to him too. Um, which is actually why I thought I, my friend said I should call you anyway and let you know the last time I talked to him. Yeah, absolutely. So. I mean, any help we can get from anybody with any kind of contact with him, uh, yeah, I, used to, I used to talk to him quite regularly. Um, I used to live there. I live in Northern California now. Um, but after I moved, I moved a few months ago, and after I moved, we kept in touch very regularly. And, um, kind of fell back a little bit and it got down to about a couple times a week but I hadn't heard from him. I, I, I talked to him on Tuesday night. Um, I looked at my phone records on, on, the, on the internet to check and uh, I definitely talked to him Tuesday night. Think about what she just said for a moment. She finds out that Travis was murdered and right away she checks her phone records online. That would immediately send up red flags for me because why wouldn't you just have looked at your phone? The reality is that she likely checked her records online because she was anticipating this conversation with law enforcement. Once again, Jody is offering clues to the truth without even intending to. So was that, was that your cell phone or? Yeah, that was my cell phone. That's the only phone I have. Okay. Is, it this, is this the number that I called? Yeah. Okay. So that was Tuesday night. Do you remember about what time? Uh, I think it was, I want to say like a quarter after nine, but I think it was, it was sometime between eight and ten. So I know it wasn't as late as ten. Probably between eight thirty and nine thirty more, so narrow it. And uh, what did you guys talk about? Um, it was brief. He, I was um. I was driving out to Utah and, you know, he was like, are you going to come out and see me? And I'm like, no. And, you know, he, he's supposed to make a trip up here um, at the end of the month because he, we, um, thing that we are doing is called, uh, there's a book called A Thousand Places to See Before You Die. And it's been featured on the Travel Channel and all that. And we sort of got into that last year where we were starting to see all these different places on the list. And we thought, you know, a thousand places is a lot of places, but why not? That would be a fun goal. So we each kind of have that goal. And, and one of the places is the Oregon coast. Um, Another very common trait of pathological liars is verbose rambling whenever they construct a series of lies. They seem to believe that by providing extensively detailed stories, that it somehow bolsters the credibility and believability of the story being told. However, Jody's nonsensical storytelling would only serve to narrow the focus of law enforcement onto her when viewed through the lens of a seasoned detective. And the Shakespearean Festival, and so he was going to come up here for that. Um, and then we were just going to go see that in Crater Lake and, and just different landmarks. What was that trip already scheduled, or just something you guys talked about? Um, it was, it was, it was wasn't officially like dated, but I had been trying to reach him so that I could solidify my own schedule because I was planning on making a trip down there. Um, you know, but uh, it was supposed to happen in May, and then it was supposed to happen um, last week, and that didn't work out. So he was going to leave for Cancun today, and. Um, and then he said as soon as he gets back from Cancun, he was going to trip because he's going to drive up the coast. And when he reaches me, we'll go do some things, and then he'll continue on to Washington and see some friends up there. Um, and then I guess that was supposed to happen before the beginning of July. Um, July, he was supposed to go to Washington, D.C. Okay. Did, did he have uh, any issues with anybody here in, in town? Any enemies? Um, anybody that wanted to do a harm? You know, he got his tires wet. It was last year. Uh, he was he, he said he was worried about that. Um, and I was worried about that. He never locked his doors. 
and I told I was telling him, lock your door, and he was like, you're not my mom, you know, and um, I come from, uh, he comes from a, a bad city, I think he comes from Ruby, New California, which is gang and violence, but, and I come from a similar uh, type of neighborhood in California, so I've always, my parents and I, we've always locked our doors, and that's just my habit, but he doesn't have that habit, and he lives in a great neighborhood, and it's never been an issue, and nothing has ever been stolen, nothing has ever been it's important to note that several of Travis's friends and family would allege that they believe that Jody had slashed Travis's tires in retaliation for him seeing other women. But always an opportunist, Jody uses this incident to try and insinuate that someone other than her had wanted to cause harm to Travis. But watch how Travis's family responds to Jody's nonsensical commentary. I don't remember when it was. It was last year sometime around Christmas, I think. Um, and, you know, other than that... Now, how, how would you describe your, your relationship with him? We dated for... We dated for like five months. And we broke up and we continued actually to see each other for uh, quite a bit. Um, you know, right up until I moved. When did you guys uh, break up? We officially broke up June 29th of last year. But we didn't, we, even though we broke up, we were no longer boyfriend and girlfriend. We decided to remain friends, but, you know, I, I kind of feel embarrassed talking about this, but it was more like, it was more than friends, but it wasn't boyfriend and girlfriend. It was more like kind of buddy, you know what I mean? Yeah, okay. So you guys were not, like, uh, romantically uh, together at any time, or...? We, we were intimate, um, but I wouldn't say romantic as far as the relationship goes, but we were in no way headed toward marriage. Did you catch that? Detective Flores just asked Jody if they had been together romantically at any time, but her response leads down to one of the many motives for why I believe she ended Travis's life. Jody says we were in no way headed towards marriage. Detective Flores didn't ask anything about marriage, but her response tells us one of the many issues that Jody clearly had with Travis. And in this same call, she will again reveal just how critically important this issue was to her. Um, we're talking about that. We probably feel sometimes. Now you say intimate, does, does that include like a sexual relationship with him? Yeah, it does. Okay. I know it's kind of embarrassing to talk about something I know. Like that, and, and you I, don't know me, so. Yeah, and if you could just keep it confidential for now, yeah. because I know that it, you know, he's warm and he's not seriously looked down upon him in our church. And, I mean, I just, I'm telling you this to help in any way I can. Okay. I appreciate it. Um, yeah, so, you actually moved back to California a couple of months ago? Yeah, I did. Okay, what, what date was that? Do you remember? Um, I don't remember the exact date. I mean, I had the date that I went to the U-Haul. It was early April. Early, like before April 10th. It was after the first, but before the 10th. So, I'm guessing 7th, 8th, 9th, maybe. I'd have to check the date then. Did, did you stop by the house uh, when you went to the U Haul to say goodbye to him? Oh yeah, back in fact, um, after I was I was almost moved out completely out of my house for about a week afterward, and I just stayed at this house the whole time. I mean, I practically lived there, um, even when I was there. I spent I spent the night there several times a week while I lived there. Um, I came over and I cleaned his house a lot. He sort of he paid me a little bit every month to keep his house nice and clean, sort of like a housekeeper. Jody's commentary about having practically lived at Travis's house sounds innocent enough at first. But the more she talks, the more evident it becomes that she's attempting to provide an early explanation for why her DNA, hair, and other physical evidence will likely be found all around the crime scene. It's incredibly evident, however, that Jody doesn't understand the science of criminal forensics. And again, she provides details that only serve to raise the growing suspicion of her involvement. Um, did you ever uh, happen to meet any of his roommates at that time? Um, at the time, time yeah, I knew his room really well at the time. Um, 
various roommates. Some have moved out. One guy moved to Utah and one guy moved to Phoenix. Um, Zach is the, I don't know if Zach is still there. I think he is. Yeah, he is. Um, yeah, I knew Zach because I met him. And, uh, you know, we, we sort of connected because he's a photographer like I am. And, you know, he took the room that, that Aaron was with him previously. So. Yeah. Daniel, what do you what do you think about Zach? What, what, what do you think his relationship is with, uh, with your ex-boyfriend? Um, he seems like a nice guy. When I first met him, he seemed um just like a normal guy. He's a returned missionary um from and he served. Okay, good. I didn't lose you. Um, no, no. he served his, he served his mission. I don't I think in Arizona. And he liked it so much that he moved back. He knew Travis from church, so you know. Um, yeah, him and his girlfriend were there. There, I think there was some alcohol there at one time. Travis um, was suspicious about it, but he said he used it for cooking. You know, that's fine because you know Mormons don't drink alcohol. But um, well, so uh, <laughs> yeah, so they're not supposed to. <laughs> and Travis, you know, that's another thing. When it came to that, we call it the word of wisdom: no alcohol, tobacco, drugs, yeah. or or, co- or co- coffee or tea. And he was just super, super, super strict on that. Yeah. He wouldn't even take Excedrin for a headache because it had caffeine. Like he was so strict on that. I'm, I'm a little less strict on that. I'll pop Excedrin any day, but... There's a lot of um, Diet Cokes in the fridge. Yeah, they're not Travis's, I can guarantee you that. He wouldn't even touch Coke. So, it's one of his other roommates, I guess. Detective Flores is about to set his first big trap for Jody, and Jody is about to walk right into it. And uh, that was around April that you last saw him, right? Early. You, you well, haven't you haven't been back in town since then. No, I haven't at all. Um, okay. I, I thought somebody had mentioned your name, and you've been back in town for like a week or a couple of days. Oh, I've, I've been I've been thinking about going there. So yeah, I've been definitely planning on heading down there. Um, but you haven't physically been here since since you left. Since I moved, no, I haven't. I was gonna go this week, actually, while he was in Cancun and stay at his house, but it's just not in the budget. So. This skilled detective just masterfully backed Jody into a corner and got her to state the first of many provable lies. She contends that the last time she saw Travis was in early April. However, when confronted with the fact that someone had seen her recently, she doesn't deny it. She seems to try to avoid providing an absolute denial by stating that she had made plans to go, but sadly it just wasn't in the budget. This is another trait of experienced pathological liars, their ability to dissemble and mislead by providing non-answers while still sounding like they're providing one is an unmistakable hallmark of their dysfunction, and it's intended to discourage any further questioning. Yeah, no, actually, it's not. That's what I emailed him about last week. It was kind of last minute. So I was going to go, I'm looking at a calendar here. I was going to go not this week, but the next. And then he was going to come up here that following week, which was before July. And um, it all sounds kind of weird. We're all like travelers. Um, and I figured, you know, it would be a good idea if I, I would have a place to stay. His house is open all the time to friends. I mean, anybody in his business or anybody that comes to visit, he gives up his bed, he'll sleep on the couch, he lets them have the whole room. Um, so it just didn't seem like, he said the door is always open, so I would have felt totally okay just showing up and staying in his house and eating his frozen dinners, et cetera, et cetera. And he would have been fine with that too. And I just, you know, he said, just always give me a heads up. So I, I asked him, you know, let me know if that's cool. It's not only good arrangements, I never heard back. Jody is attempting to paint Travis as being a completely carefree person who apparently was operating an unlicensed hotel that had people coming and going, sleeping in his bed at all hours of the day and night. However, this is not at all how people who knew Travis described him. And in fact, they would often speak about how Jody would sneak into his house through the doggy door despite Travis's attempts to get her to stop. Jody Arias clearly has no sense of boundaries whatsoever. And when was that email? Uh, just a few days ago, I didn't find the computer, so I can check right now for you. Yeah. 
The relationship of Travis and Jody was volatile, at times abusive, and clearly dysfunctional to say the least. We can see from the very beginning that Jody was attempting to cast Travis in the worst possible light, while also making herself out to be an innocent bystander who had simply been the unintended victim of a messy and abusive relationship for which she bears little to no responsibility. Or 
I think it had stripes. I think it had like, and, and they're not like colored stripes, they're just like stripes in the brown pattern, so. Oh, like, you know, it's, it's dark brown, but it's got a little bit darker brown, yeah. like threading. Yeah, yeah, you can see that there's a pattern there. And the sheet may be more of like a checkered thing, I think, if I remember correctly. And it's his cover too, his is, bed is spread is like, it's a down comforter that's white and then it's got like a, I don't know what he used to call it, it has a special name. But so it's, it's like, like a duvet cover? Yes, yeah, it's a duvet. What, what does the duvet look like? Um, it, it comes like, like it's, it's got buttons on the end and it covers the whole thing and you slide the, the actual comforter inside the duvet, which is what you pull off to wash or, you know, or you can, that kind of thing. So and we've like many times, it's so hard to get in there with one person. So we kind of just grab the corners and we pull it in together on one side and then you just sort of fluff it out and then button up the button. Let's stop for just a moment. If we stick to Jody's story, she just found out mere hours ago that a man that she had loved and wanted to marry was brutally attacked and murdered. And here she is trailing on about his mattress and other completely unrelated superfluous information. Jody sounds like she's in good spirits and entirely apathetic to the fact that she is speaking to a homicide detective about the death and murder of a man she loved. It's readily apparent that Jody does not realize whatsoever just how odd and off-putting her behavior truly is. Yeah, cause that, that down kind of just shoves over in one corner and it doesn't want to spread out. Yeah, exactly. Um, so it, it didn't have like any, any type of uh, edging or tassels or anything like that that you know of, like a light brown. Not that I remember. Is there anything in the house that resembled anything with some type of small tan ropish kind of material or, or edging or anything like that? A blanket? He may have pillows. Yeah, he may have had pillows. Um, yeah, he has pillows on his um, on his bed, not on the bed, but on the chair that's next to his bed. Yeah, there's some good. Yeah, there's those. Um, there's also a round pillow that he uses. Make it better than just one. He puts it in the center. And it's like there may be some kind of tassel thing on that. Do you, do you know anybody back here still that still has contact with him? Uh, yeah, lots of people, tons of people. Is that how you found out about what what had happened? A friend of mine, Dan Freeman, called me last night. Um, I met Dan through Travis. Dan Freeman. Freeman. Yeah, Barton, yeah, man. Okay, yeah, we, we talked to him as well. I met him last year with his sister when we all took a trip up to the Grand Canyon and to Sedona. So he called you last night and told you what happened? Yeah, yeah. He didn't have a lot of information. Any idea what, what everybody's talking about, what, what they're saying, what their suspicions are? Um, they're saying, what, everything that I heard was that, and I got a lot of my information from Bishop Layton, a little more details, um, and he basically that they, they took everybody and separated them, and I don't know who everybody is, I'm assuming Zach, because he was there, and his girlfriend, um, because I called Zach's cell phone, and she couldn't tell me anything, but she answered, and she said, there are a lot of people here that I don't know, but... Um, Zach's not here, so it didn't make sense, and I, I just, I was confused, but she couldn't tell me anything, so I didn't get a lot out of her, but Bishop Layton said he was there for four hours, and they interviewed everybody, and then they all went to the police station, and, um, that it, they're treating it as a suspicious, me, as a suspicious death, and I, I heard from my friend, uh, Dave Paul, that there was a lot of blood, and I don't know if that's just a rumor that's going around or true. But, and I also heard that his services will be in California, but that they haven't released his body to his grandma yet. So um, that's all I've really heard so far. We are nearly 20 minutes into the call, and this is the first sustained moment 
that Jody expresses any real semblance of emotionality in relation to Travis's homicide. But Detective Flores is 10 moves ahead on the chessboard while setting an ornate trap for Jody that will soon help to expose the myriad of cracks in her faltering deceptions. Well, I, I can tell you that we're investigating it as a homicide. Okay. And not a suspicious death anymore. It's pretty obvious. And it's important for us to find out why somebody would want to do harm to him. Um, what kind of stuff he was possibly involved in, or um, it, or maybe it just could have been as simple as a, a burglary, an intruder, or something that had gone wrong. I'm wondering if he's still, when you said, like when they said suspicious death, I thought, well, he's trying to shift pounds for Cancun, so he looks good in his boxers or a bathing suit or whatever, or swim trunks, and um. You know, I know that he takes, or I thought he takes supplements, and he works out really, really hard and in a workout. It's, it's a very intense routine, and, and um, he has these heavy dumbbells that he uses, and he's so strong. I mean, there are a couple times we've tried to wrestle just for fun and show me some moves, and there's just no, like, I don't see how anyone, unless maybe there were two people, I don't see how anyone could overpower him. Unless yeah, there were, he's a, a pretty good-sized guy. Yeah, and he was... Close to 200 pounds, I think. Yeah, yeah. It would take, I would say, two people, if not maybe more, to kind of overpower him. Um, I mean, I've, I've tried with officers, you know, working this job to take down a, a woman at 135 pounds who's out of control and it's difficult to control, you know, something yeah. like that. Jody thinks that she has just successfully convinced the detective that this crime couldn't have been committed by a single person. Have you noticed the consistent theme throughout the vast majority of her responses? Self-preservation at all costs. And this self-centered theme will persist throughout the entirety of this case and is often a common characteristic of pathological liars. They highly value how they are perceived and Jody Arias demonstrates this in spades. No ideas come to mind, huh? Why somebody would want to hurt him? Is, did he owe somebody for money? Did, did he have any worries or concerns about anybody? He did owe people money, but I, they were all good friends. They weren't, like, it wasn't a bad situation. It was, in fact, they were, there was one family that lent him money that's very, very wealthy from what I understand, and it's not like it hurt them to lend him the money. Of course, they expected him to pay it back, and he had a, a very reasonable timeline. And they also had a really good collateral in case he didn't pay back. Um, they, they owned a piece of stock that he owned, so if they didn't pay him back, it was like six thousand dollars or something. Um, or yeah, I think it was six thousand. But if they didn't, if he didn't get them paid back on time, then they would just keep the stock, which would eventually be worth over twenty-five thousand. So I mean, they, I don't think they were worried about that at all. Uh, those were that's the Hyatt family in Frank Hyatt was there last night. Um, but I don't, I don't think that was when he was struggling financially several months back. And, and um, I don't know, I haven't talked to him about how that's going since. Um, but I know that that's... What's the um, situation with, with the car that was, uh, somebody mentioned a BMW? Yeah, I'm buying a BMW. Okay, because then you know, we found a check that was written by you uh, to him. Mm -hmm. I think it was last month. Yeah, yeah, I recently held him a check. Um, I know from that and a few other things. He, um, I'm making payments to him. Okay, do you still have that car right now? No, it's actually not in my possession. I did the dumb thing. Um, I went and hooked it up to the U-Haul. Everything was cool and set to go. And I, I got the dolly that where the back wheel on the ground because it was cheaper. Yeah. And the U-Haul guy said, okay, drive it up here. Okay, stop, brake. And everything was cool. And I stopped the car and turned it off. Um, both got the car, left the door open so they could look at everything, and they shut the door and said, you're good to go, and I took off, and it was going to sound really dumb, and I realized now that this is not how you tow a car, but I left it in first gear, yeah. and I started headed down the highway, and I blew the engine to smithereens. Um, it looks like it gave birth all over the highway, there's just black oil everywhere, and um, so it's sitting at Wes's auto something, last time I checked. Um, 
Now, it may be due to the fact that I've spent over a hundred hours listening to Jody Arias and the related coverage in my research of this video series, but this entire story sounds like complete BS. But even if it's true, this is exactly why people take such issue with pathological liars. Because even when they tell the truth, their need to tell such elaborate stories makes it extremely difficult to tell the difference between their truths and their lies. Um, 16 years in Mesa, and uh, the guy's been really nice about keeping it until Travis figured out what he could do. We've called, we've called lawyers about it, and my lawyer said, um, you know, um, have your insurance fix it, and his lawyer said your insurance might not fix it because it might be considered mechanical. So that's the less we talked about it. We've been, um, he's been real busy and hasn't had a lot of time to attend to it. And I have a vehicle right now, but not for much longer because I have to give it back to the bank. So, um, you know, when, either when way. When did you ma mail that payment at the bank? Um, it was a few weeks ago. Yeah, it must have been. So you're still, you're still making payments to that? Oh, yeah. I, in fact, that's my first payment because we, I just, we just did this car deal like right before I moved. And he said, we had a, oh, oh we have a uh, buyer's agreement too, I think, that I checked out and mailed to him. Um, but uh, we have, like he said, just get on your feet, you know, and then start sending payments. And the agreement was no X amount for months, whatever I can pay. So I finally got a job. And, that for what, what was that? $200 a month? Yeah. It was um, $100 a month minimum. Okay. Minimum. And if I could pay more, pay monthly, you know. This next line of questioning from Detective Flores is the most important part of this entire call. Listen very closely to how Jody responds. Let's really analyze this for a moment. Jody has just been told that the friends and family of Travis have not said anything good about her. They accuse her of overstaying her welcome, showing up uninvited, stalking, hacking, and obsessing over Travis. And Jody's response to all of this is to ignore it entirely, failing to provide any defense against any of it, and then allege that Travis gave her access to all of his social media accounts as a means to earn back her trust. For me, this demonstrates just how deranged the mind of Jody Arias truly is because she has an excuse for absolutely everything. And if you've ever encountered anyone who is a pathological liar, this is something you have likely witnessed yourself because sadly it's a common characteristic of their dysfunction. Not long ago, probably three weeks ago, maybe. And I don't know about his because I haven't, once he made it clear that he wasn't comfortable with that anymore, I didn't even try to get back into his account anymore. So. Yeah, I mean, I've been married almost 20 years, and I don't have my wife's email. Really? <laughs> I know. It's, you know, you just have to trust sometimes. You know, it's true. You know, you 
It's true. And I told him, you know, we've had, we've had hours upon hours of conversation. And I said, you know, I just don't know if, if I could ever trust you again. You know, and, and he, he doesn't know if he could ever trust me again because I might always want to get back into his phone and find out does he really have something going on or, or what. Because, you know, he did at one point. Um, or, you know, and so he said, yeah, I understand that. And he said, but if we were married, you would have all my passwords and everything there wouldn't be anything to worry about. Yeah. And I thought, well, that's nice, you know? Yeah. But we're not married. <laughs> so, and as far as getting into his emails, that never happened. Um, what he has on his computer is, um, if you would, oftentimes just leave his computer on okay. and he'll leave his Gmail window up. And there were times when I got on the computer to look up other things and if his Gmail window was up open, then I would just close it. Did you hear that? She says that she never got into his email, but less than two minutes ago, she admits that she was still accessing his social media and email three weeks before, and that Travis had told her to stop. She lies so fast and so often, even she can't keep track of it. And just before that, you may have noticed that she again brought up marriage with Travis. You can hear in her voice how much of an issue this was to her and it is likely one of the many reasons she finally snapped and ended his life. Um, you know, I had to mention that to you because uh, we are getting a, a search warrant for his email, uh, or, you know, Gmail and Facebook. Those yeah. accounts, and we can't tell where those things were accessed from by IP addresses. Yeah. And I just, want to, I just want to make it clear that um, Know that if, if you did access it from somewhere else at a, at a certain time, you know, if you access it from California, we're going to know. Yeah, I'll tell you right now that I did. Okay. He gave me his password. No, the only accounts that I've accessed though were MySpace and Gmail because those are the only passwords. And how long, how long ago, when, when was the last time you actually accessed them? Just to reiterate, she just said that she never got into his email. But now confronted with a subpoena, she's forced to admit the truth. This entire call is absolutely unbelievable. A uh, week ago, we had um, we had a conversation where it's like we, he made it clear that he wasn't comfortable with that anymore, and um, and I said that's okay. And he and I changed my Gmail account password because he got into that too, and then he saw another guy's email there um, and gave me a hard time about it. And so it just was dumb. It's, you know, we're both trying to move on. Yeah. We're both, I don't know. I think there was a lot of jealousy issues. I think there might have been on both parts. Um, for me, it wasn't so much jealousy as it was like, I just, I just wanted to know. Okay, really, Jody? You weren't jealous? You showed up to his house unannounced. You were credibly accused of stalking him. You freaked out when you saw him with other women when you were no longer together, and you logged into his email and social media accounts for almost a year after you broke up. But you weren't jealous. Sure, okay, we'll we'll go with that. Like, I just wanted him to be honest. And for him, I think there, one of the reasons I moved was because we were spending too much time together and we weren't, we weren't moving on. And um, it wasn't able to get to the I mean, I guess I could have dated other people, but our social circles were so small that any time you heard about something, it, it, it just wasn't good. Did you, did you move down here the first time because of him? Yeah, yeah. I moved there because of him, and I moved away because of him. Primarily. I, I also moved away for financial reasons. I'm down here now, but, you know, there are three main reasons I moved here. One, I moved my family to financially, and three was because of travel. And the main reason that I moved there was because of travel. Okay. Yeah, because um, when we first arrived on scene and started talking to people and uh, some of his closest friends, um, you know, began mentioning your name and, you know, hey, you need to call her because she probably knows what happened to him or she possibly has something to do with it. Oh, gosh. No, I think that, that's how bad it was getting. At the and, I, you know, I needed to talk to you to find out why they would say something like that. Uh, why would they would start pointing fingers in your direction right away. Um, I don't know, maybe I'm, maybe because I'm the ex-girlfriend, we have lots of fights. Was, it, was there a lot of issues? Uh... Now imagine again, you've 
just been accused of a homicide. And the best answer you've got is, oh gosh, I, I don't know, maybe because I'm the ex-girlfriend. Even this experienced, lifelong pathological liar doesn't seem to know how to answer this question because a truly innocent person would likely immediately proclaim their innocence and push back on the assertion that they had anything whatsoever to do with the crime. But this is just the beginning of Jody's arduous fight to stay off of death row. You know, I mean, obviously it wasn't, you know, it wasn't a great relationship. Uh, it was great for a while until we, until it, it almost started. Yeah, you know, we started fighting because I, I did know him staying and I got him to his phone because I had a suspicion I, that he wasn't being faithful and I found, you know, a bunch of text messages that were no good. And um, rather than being an adult about it and confronting him, I, I kept it in and I kind of let it fester and, you know, I was miserable and he didn't know why and I wanted to tell him that I was worried that it would just lead to a unnecessary fight and then I realized this was no kind of relationship so it finally all came out and he was really apologetic but we just both realized that neither of us could be in a in an adult relationship, and that was June of last year. So, at that point, we, um, we continued to see each other you know, a long time after that. Well, you know, I, I'm glad I, I did get a hold of you and you, you did call me because it kind of clears up a lot of the questions I had, a lot of the concerns. It's not what, I, I don't think it's what these people thought. Yeah. Detective Flores just showed why he is truly exceptional at his job. He successfully convinces Jody that he believes her story, that she couldn't possibly be the person responsible for this crime, and that the concerns of Travis's friends and family were simply unfounded and misplaced. And the best part? Jody actually believes him. And as a result of this, she will continue to talk to Detective Flores long after she's been arrested for the homicide of Travis Alexander. Um, I should probably, I should probably tell you that, you know, Travis, when he got upset, he would send me, um, really new emails. Um, he would send me text messages and things. Um, you'll find probably some stuff on his Facebook. I know for sure you'll find one on Facebook and definitely in his Gmail and you're welcome to access all of my accounts too if you want. Um, with Travis... Well, we're with probably going to um, subpoena all his Facebook and Gmail and, you know, everything to see who he was communicating with, what he was saying, um, what he was saying to him. Okay. You know, uh, I'm not sure how far back uh, we usually go six months to a year. Okay. Uh, but... Uh, in a case like this, you know, we need to know, you know, who had some type of family, you know, why they would do something like this. Um, you know, I think it's probably going to be a phone, but, you know, like I said, it is a homicide investigation. And uh, it was an angry situation. And, and when we see scenes like this, um, you know, the first thing we think is, these people hated each other. Uh, somebody went in there to, to hurt him, and, and they did. And they hurt him really bad. And he's a big guy, and it would take, you know, like I mentioned to you before, it would take more than one person to do this to him. Can you? And I, I, I was just hoping maybe you could kind of point me in the right direction. I, I'm talking to everybody no. that you know that. I want to talk to a guy named Thomas Brown, um, and I don't think that, honestly, I haven't seen or heard from him since he was kicked out. Um, I think his last name was Brown. I can try to find him on, on LBSLeague.com, but um, it was, you know, that was so long ago, though. That was last spring of 2007, March, you know, and, and what happened was he got kicked out because he was considered like borderline sexual predator, not like a rapist, but coming onto girls and, and you know, that kind of thing. And it's just really looked down upon in the church. And so he was just fellowship and Travis said, you need to get out, you know, get your stuff out of my house. And it wasn't a friendly situation. It was said over the phone because he and I were in um, 
Missouri and somewhere back east, just touring. And, um, and um, Thomas was. So he ended up taking him out at that time? Yeah, he kicked him out at the time, but Thomas, you know, is, is, he's a really big guy, but he doesn't seem like, the, he doesn't seem violent, he seemed pretty gentle, he just seemed like a little bit thuggish, but like he was trying to act the part, not because he was that, because maybe because he thought it would like attract chicks or something, I don't know. This is the final moment we will analyze in today's video, and when we consider what we now know about this case, this is one of Jody's lowest moments. She knows that she committed this crime, and yet she sets off to try and point law enforcement in the direction of a completely innocent party. Imagine if law enforcement didn't have any of the compelling evidence against her, and there was some suspicion against Travis's former roommate. She knowingly could have caused him to be charged, prosecuted, and even put to death for a crime that he had nothing to do with. It's happened before. But this is just the first video of our detailed analysis of the Jody Arias case. And in the next video, we will begin to delve into Jody's subsequent conversations with law enforcement. A conversation where Jody would accidentally reveal something only the killer knew. Subscribe for episode two of the Jody Arias case, getting posted as part of our bi-weekly posting schedule in two weeks. We'll see you next time on Behind Criminal Minds.